welcome to God's Word for us that come Ghana's online Christian station. Be blessed as you listen to messages on the site. Well, the secret of obedience. A system that has no obedience in it cannot live long. I want you to turn your Bible with me to Matthew chapter 7. And I'm reading from verse 24. Matthew 7 from verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not. For it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So he's giving us two cases. In one case, somebody built his house on the rock. The rain fell or descended. The floods came and the Bible said, and the winds blew and they beat upon the house. Remember, the rain descended, the floods came, And the winds blew over the houses of the two people. The wise man that built it on the rock. The assailants of nature. Assailants of nature. Rain, flood, and wind came against his house. The foolish man also, the assailants of nature, came against his house. Wind and rain and flood. They don't blow in your life depending on whether you are wise or foolish. They will attack both the wise and the foolish. The only thing is that after they have attacked, the wise man's work will stand, but the foolish man's work will collapse. And Jesus said, He that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them shall be likened unto the wise man who built his house on the rock. And when the winds blew and the rain descended and the floods came, that house survived. In other words, the key to surviving storms, winds, and rains is obedience. Somebody shout obedience. Come on, scream it again, obedience. And obedience depends on many, many things. I want to pick just one. And I will drive that one until we close the service. The ability to obey. You can never obey an instruction you don't have the ability to obey. For example, if somebody is has lost his sight and you tell the person, see, he cannot see because he hasn't got the ability to obey. The Lord told me some time ago, he said, I don't send my people on major assignments because they don't have what it takes to obey me. I said, I don't understand. Then he taught me something. He taught me that he will not give you an instruction if you cannot obey it. So, there are many of us here, God will not tell you, give me, let's say, $1 $1 million. Because if God gives you an instruction to give him $1 million, he will wait up to the return of Christ and the $1 million is not forthcoming because you don't have the means to do it. So the Lord told me, he said, there are many, many good people. I don't send them because if I send them, they cannot obey. I pray that God will give you what it takes 
for him to send you and you will obey because you have what it takes to obey him. God cannot tell you, give me a house when you don't have the house to give to him. God cannot tell you, give me a car if you don't have what it takes to obey him. I get worried when people are building things that cannot outlive them. One of the things that really encourages me when I come into an environment like this is to see that a church is doing things that will outlive the leaders. One day, we went to a funeral. My wife and I, Pastor Steve was in that funeral. And um, the pastor of the church who had pastored for so many years. The man had died and we were now believing God to raise funds to complete a church building. My wife was sitting by me. I told her, I said, Pearl, this place is a university. Open your eyes and learn. In fact, that funeral, I went with my wife one week to the funeral. That was in July. I went with my wife to the place one week to the time. I told the Azepel, we are going there to learn. We went one week earlier. In fact, not exactly a week, about five days. We went there on a Tuesday. The funeral was on a Saturday. The Sunday was my wife's birthday. And I told her, I want to give you a birthday present. Let's go to a funeral. That is your birthday present. I said, you know what, wifey? The best place to be is a funeral ground. You learn. It is better than going to wedding. Wedding is for jokers. Funeral is for people who want to maximize life. I don't go to funeral to cry. I go to open my eyes. When I go to a funeral, I sit down, I learn, I watch things, I see. You see, you have a church building. You have a youth, whatever. You are occupying land. Some of us are here on our own, in our own houses. You are 45 years, 50. You are married, 35. But you are still renting a house and you are not worried. I'm not saying by all means get one. What I'm saying is may God give you grace by 35 years old to be in your own house. Because you see, it is such a huge advantage if one day you are not on earth and your family is in a house of their own. Right from your young age of about in your 20s, you should start thinking, I want my own house. To pastor a church for many, many, many years, if you are able to do something like this, it's a powerful thing. God is not able to send his people to do assignments because they cannot obey. I have seen cases where God rather sends unbelievers in fact, I asked a lot of questions. I said, why do you send unbelievers? Why do you give unbelievers assignments when there are believers? He said, many of the believers cannot obey. And I said, I don't understand. Then I looked in the ministry of Jesus. I saw one typical example that really settled my spirit. When Jesus wanted two donkeys to go into Jerusalem, the Bible said, he called his disciples and then he told them, he said, I want to go into Jerusalem and I need two donkeys to ride. But I want you to go into that village and you will see two donkeys tied. Untie them and bring them. And when the owner comes and asks you why you are untying them, tell the owner the master has need of them. 
Now this thing, I don't know whether it is stealing, confiscation, taking by faith. But if you want to practice it after service today, go and take Pastor Steve's car and go home. And when Pastor Steve asks you, tell him the master has need of it. You know, sometimes I, I read about all these people say, oh, and these modern day pastors, they are thieves, and these pastors take people's money. I said, so if you are alive in Jesus' day, what will you do? He's taking people's donkey without permission. I keep saying the biggest hypocrites I've seen are Christians. Yeah, we can be hypocritical. Big time. No, hypocritical. Oh, and uh, they, uh, they, they say, oh, there's something in it. They are using juju. So if you were there in Jesus' day, what would you say? Man who can say, go and catch fish. The first fish, there will be money in the mouth. Take the money and go and pay tax. If a man of God removes money from the mouth of a dog today, you mean you go to the church again? Ah, ah, dear, dear. And then he walked on water. People are fine with that. Sometimes you, you meet Christians and they tell you they don't tithe. They, that's why I wrote the book. I don't believe in tithing. They tell you they don't tithe. Then they say, show me the tithe in the New Testament. I'm like, oh, why? Don't go on. Let's start with other things. Show me your wedding ring in the New Testament. There's no wedding ring. There's no wedding gown. No flower girls. No page boys. But when you are wedding, look at the amount of money you spend. And look at your wedding you spend the money on and tell me how many of the things are in the Bible, including the cake. But you see, it's a hypocritical spirit. I have a wedding ring on, but the truth is that it is not in the Bible. It is common sense. And sometimes when we don't want to give, we find all kinds of excuses. And then they say, oh, Jesus was not raising offering the way you people raise offerings. I agree. But the methods he used they were wild. Go to that village. You will see two donkeys tied. Can you imagine? I send you right now to the, what is the name of that? That, that junction. Atomic junction. And I said, go there. We are going for crusade. You will see two articulated trucks parked. Push them and bring them. There's no key in the articulated truck. Just start, remove the block and the chalk and push and bring it. When they ask you, tell them the Reverend Steve Mensah is going on a crusade and he needs them and see what they will do to you. But you see, the people went. They saw the donkeys. They were untying them. The owner came and they said, the master has need of them. And they released it. But they didn't raise money to get the donkeys. Because one person was in a position to provide it. I see a time coming. God is going to raise some people. I have been telling people, don't worry about offering. If, if your worry is offering, don't worry. Very soon it will be over. Listen, man of God, I see a time coming. Tithes and offering with tithes envelopes will leave the church. Offering envelope will leave the church. Don't worry. Because in that hour, out of this big church, God will take only 10 people and tell the rest, keep your money. And those 10 people, like that land we are trying to get, those 10 people, one of them will come to you and say, man of God, how much does that land cost? You tell him $500,000. He says, it is done. Just like Jesus died for the whole world. Forget about this whole church. That thing. I was going to build 
a memorial hall for my father. When my father died, my father was the first convert in our village. In fact, in that whole area, he was the first elderly man to get converted. And so I decided to build a memorial hall in his memory so that we can be worshipping there in the village. One man walked up to me. He said, Daddy, take this money as a deposit for your father's memorial hall. And you know what he told me? I want to build it alone so that when I go to heaven, I will receive that reward alone. Don't allow anybody to give a penny towards that memorial hall. So you know what? I have not raised the funds to build that building because it is not necessary. One person is an integrity rescuer. We need integrity rescuers in the body of Christ. Because you know what, ladies and gentlemen, anytime you are raising some money to do something important, some people impose anger and offense on themselves. They won't give, but they are angry. You see, even if you want to give, and after giving, get angry. Your anger will be logical. But for you not to give and run commentary and get angry. Mentias here. But integrity rescuers are coming. And all those says, Pastor, just put those envelopes down. Don't talk to anybody. It's on me. I see people come. Look, I see God raising them. In a church, maybe just about six. Convention is coming. Bam! They take care of it. Crusade is coming. Three people. One goes to put a check down. 300,000, 400,000, 500,000. Man of God, run the crusade. A time is coming. I pray you will be one of those people. I'm talking about the ability to obey. Paul told the Philippians, he said, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. You, the Philippians, he said, you sent once and again unto my necessity. I'm just praying that God will raise the Bill Gates. One day I read, in, I read a certain article and Bill Gates, one man, had given $78 million to AIDS Foundation. One man. One man. I remember in the early days of my Christianity, when I, or ministry, I saw Creflo Dollar was ministering. And the man was very powerful. That guy can teach. And he teaches sometimes with the hand in the pocket. Very relaxed. Not the way we scream in Africa. Oh, you know, God, God bless you, and God, God can do anything, and God is powerful. God, and you know, God, God, God. I'm like, hey, a queen. Let me share now. In our pocket, in our God, God, God. And you know, this morning, God, you're gonna bring an offering, and you're gonna bless the work of God, and God's gonna be here, and I'm like, God, God. <laughs> then I said, ah, which young boy is preaching like this? Then I saw Ivan the Holyfield sitting down and writing notes. So I said, ah, that's why the pastor is talking like that. <laughs> because if Holyfield is in your church, his tithe alone can let you change God's name from God to God. <laughs> no, Aquan, only, only his tithe. But I'm telling you, when you go to a church, which is a Wahala church, and they are raising offering. You can tell. That is the one everybody has to dance around the offering bowl. And sing a song. Jehovah turns my life around. He they are believing God for their lives to turn around. He turns my life around. Oh, he makes a way where there is no way. Jehovah has them. They are really believing God. This Wahelian. But integrity rescuers. Where you are determined that this thing is going to work, is going to be possible. I pray that God will raise people like that. He said, go 
I give you an instruction. You will see two donkeys tied. Untie them and bring them. When the owner asks you, tell them, tell the owner, the master has need of it. If you don't have the donkeys, God will never send people to come to you. May God look in your house and see what he needs and send his messengers to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Over here, I'm not talking about tithe. I'm not talking about offering. I'm talking about people that are able to take hold of an assignment. Somebody has to go and pray and say, Lord, I need you to give me some things because something must be done in the kingdom and I am the one you will have to use. thing has to be done. God told the children of Israel, he said, go and borrow silver and gold. Go into the wilderness. Later on, he told Moses, he said, Moses, go to my people and receive my offering. I have given something to them and I want it back. Almost many of the things God gives to you are not your own. He will come back for it later. The, the, the thing about God blessing you is that before you start rejoicing that it is yours, wait until he tells you something about it. No, God can give you a car and you are rejoicing. And the Lord will come to you after a few days and tell you the thing is not yours. One day I had a friend who went and bought a very nice watch. Very, very nice watch. Nice. And um, he, he did it well. I won't describe the watch. Because it's a, it's a wild one. He wore it two times. He bought it for thousands of dollars. And used it twice. After the second time, God told him, put the watch down. The owner will come for it. I went to preach in that church in Lagos. I was preaching, preaching, preaching. After the meeting, the guy came to me. He said, Reverend, do you like watches? I said, yes. I think he looked at the one I was wearing. And he decided to ask me a question because the one I was wearing, uh, it was still believing God. <laughs> so he said, do you like watches? And I said, yes. He said, I mean watches. I said, yeah, I like watches. He said, okay, I'll come to your hotel. He came to the hotel. Then he brought two boxes. And he told me, I brought the watch. I brought a watch to you. He told me the value. I said in my head, you should have sold this watch. And brought the money and laid at the apostles' feet. Because we were believing God to complete our church building. I need money for church building. No watch. He mentioned the value of the watch. I said, meaning by now. What's, what's wrong with this man? He told me the value. Then he told me, he said, Reverend, I really like this watch. But when I got it and I wore it once or twice, the Lord told me, keep the watch. The owner will come for it. And when you were preaching, God told me, you are the owner of the watch. So I brought your watch to you. Man of God, there are people who are holding God's things in their house. You can have a land and God will tell you it belongs to him. A car and God will tell you it belongs to him. Listen, you can have a husband and God will come and take him. Because God will call him into the ministry. Some of you, your husbands are into very bare business. And you have warned them to keep a respectable distance between themselves and the Bible. And any time anointing service is going on and your husband is going for the oil, when he comes and they anoint him with the oil, and he comes to sit and say, Kwame, oil you can hear why? I know women who have kept their husbands away from the ministry. And I know men who have kept their wives from the ministry. Anything that belongs to God, you cannot keep it. 
May God make us understand obedience. Obedience. You will meet the man. The man has the donkeys. Tell him to release them and you release. We have two problems. Number one, people that could have obeyed the instruction, but they have no donkey. Number two, people that have the donkey, but they don't have God, so they cannot hear God. Number three is people that have the donkey and they can hear God. May you be the person who has the donkey and you can hear God. That if God speaks to you right now and says, I want you to give me a house. May you be able to give that God that house in the mighty name of Jesus. But you see, our trouble is we have grown so used to certain things that the spirit of obedience has left the house. Many people are not listening to God again. All we know is, okay, let me just give my tithe to God. After giving God my tithe, I'm fine. So we give God the tithe at the end of the month and then we go back home and then we sleep sometimes we just clap for ourselves and we say hallelujah i mean all is done i want you to give me a certain scripture in the bible first kings chapter 9 and the verse number 10 first kings 9 verse 10 and it came to pass at the end of 20 years when solomon had built the two houses. The house of the Lord and the king's house. Keep going. Now, Hiram, the king of Ty, had furnished Solomon with cedar trees and um, fair trees and with gold according to all his desire that King Solomon gave Hiram 20 cities in the land of Galilee. Everybody say 20 cities. Now, the man has moved away from giving animals and things like that. He has started donating cities as an offering. So, the guy takes the whole of Abilengwe and he says, it's a gift. Can you imagine if God dashes you a poor residential area? I like the way you are. But receive it in the name of Jesus. It is possible. city can belong to you. We are satisfied with too little. But God needs a lot to do the work of the kingdom. When we preach it, people say it's prosperity message. It is not prosperity message. It is ability message. And thou shall remember the Lord thy God because it is he that given the power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant and poverty will always be an antagonist of the kingdom poverty has never been a kingdom ally when you are sick poverty is not a friend if you are going to have wedding poverty is not a friend if you are going to write an exam poverty is not a friend i don't know where it is a friend it's never a friend even when you are dead, it is not a friend. Your funeral may not be well attended. They'll just throw you away somewhere. 20 cities. Go back to 20 cities. May God give you 20 cities. I see, I'm sure many of us, if we get 20 cities, we'll just shout amen and we're happy. King Hiram had given Solomon gold. And you and I know that during Solomon's father's time, that man used to still give. But let's see what happened. Verse 12. And Hiram came out of Tyre to see the cities which Solomon had given him, and they pleased him not. Twenty cities. He's not happy. Verse 12. Verse 13. And he said, what cities are these? Which thou hast given me, my brother. I think Hiram was an ever man. It's ever who say my brother. How many of you are always here? Ever. Uh -huh. Now that guy came from Volta Rich. What cities are these, my brother? And he called the name of the land 
Kabul until this day. Kabul means good for nothing. He said these 20 cities, they are good for nothing. You may say that guy is arrogant, but that guy knew what he wanted. Listen, you are holding something in your hand. It cannot fulfill your vision. How many years will you have to contribute money with your salary before you can build a house or support the kingdom? I pray that God will lift you up to another level. You will not go to God and say, what I have is Kabul, but it is okay for you to go to God and say, Lord, I thank you, but it is not enough. There are too many needs around you for you to be happy with what you have. I know some of you, you will never tell God what you have is not enough, but I know you sing about it. There shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of God. There shall be seasons refreshing. Then he said, send from the Savior above showers of blessing. Showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling. But the mercy drops are falling. But we are asking for the showers. Lord, my salary is in the thousands, but take me to the hundreds of thousands. I am in the hundreds of thousands, but take me into the millions. Open your mouth wide and God will feel it. I see somebody here in your lifetime. One day, you will take a checkbook and write a check of one million Ghana cities. One million dollars. Oh, few of you are saying amen. You see, I'm not, I'm not preaching a prosperity message. I'm preaching an ability message. An enablement message. I'm preaching something that will make you come to a place in the kingdom where you will be relevant. I was in a church in Nigeria when the pastor was raising funds. $30,000. $30,000. And when he started, he wanted everybody to give 1,000. Three of the young men rose up. I even thought they were rebels. They said, Pastor! Pastor! Stop! I said, hey, I loot about your name. They said, stop! Pastor! Don't embarrass us. Nigeria, don't say us. Us. Pastor! Don't embarrass us. Why are these people disturbing the service? Then the pastor's wife told me, those boys, they are like that. I should relax. Pastor, don't embarrass us. 30,000. You are raising funds. You are disgracing us. Pastor, 30,000. I take 10. Femi takes 10. Shola takes 10. 30,000 is paid. Pastor, go and rest. Ha! Ha! I was sitting down, second service, and I pray that your second service will be like that. They came and made an announcement. They said, we have bought our pastor a homer. And if any pastor in this city makes mistake and buys their pastor hammer, we will buy jet for our pastor. Nobody will be greater than our pastor in this state. They are determined. They are integrity rescuers. Somebody sitting there and saying, you know what? Enough of the church struggling to do things. I'm going to take care of things. Can you imagine if the land were going to do one person? Oh, I didn't even hear you say an amen. One, one person can just write a check and, says, and say, I have taken care of it. You look at it, you say, the general income in Ghana is like this and like that. Lord, I pray that you will bless me. Bless me so that I will be a blessing. He said, Abraham, I will bless you and then you will be what? A blessing. We call them integrity rescuers. So Jesus is going to take supper in a house. And he told his disciples, his methods were crude. 
Go into that town. You will see a man fetching water. When he finishes, follow him wherever he's going. So a man fetches water, he's going home, and somebody's stalking him. Then he waited to see if the guy will come and pass. The guy stopped. Say, hey, Saman, you cry. Finally, he entered the house. The man followed him there. He said, I want to see your ogre. He said, You can't see your guy. He's a very busy man. He said, Hey, show me the man and stop what you are saying. Then maybe the, the boss heard it and then came and said, What is it? He said, Sir, my master, they call him Jesus. He said he must hold his last supper in your house. And he wants your banquet hall. The man said, open the door. Put on the air conditioners. Get everything ready for him. That man provided the house because he had it. May you have what God needs. The trouble about Jesus during his lifetime was that most of the time, his disciples did not have what he needed. So he had to depend on outsiders to get it. When he even died, a tomb to bury him, the close apostles did not have it. They had to go to Joseph of Arimathea. Who followed him from afar. Because the immediate disciples, if you wanted a tomb from them, they have to take you to their great-grandfather's tomb. They don't have the tomb. Nicodemus had to bring spices for them to embalm his body. And the women, Mary Magdalene and others, they tried. But as of Peter, James, John, and others, especially in these days where sometimes the associate pastors are rather believing God for the senior pastor to take care of them. But I see God raising people because they have the ability to obey. There were many, many widows in Israel. When God had to send Elijah to somebody, he sent, her, he sent him to the widow of Zarephtah. But there were widows in Israel. Many times, God has had to depend on unbelievers. Because the believers don't have what it takes to obey. I remember we, we built a church building in Bogatanga, and after we had finished building it, in fact, Christians didn't give us money. One Muslim guy came to me and gave us $2,500. A Muslim in Bogatanga. And he said, Reverend, he spoke Frafra, our language. He said, Toba na, Toba, dike tun yen tun maya. O mame, bana o katumbo, ya kek la maya. Church, that's only kek. O tumbo la tizana. Fafa tinga wa. That means this building you built, you didn't just build it for your church. You built it for the whole of the Frafra land. Take this $2,500 and do the work of God. But you see, there were Christians in Boga who were criticizing the building. They said there's poverty and I'm going to bring glass. <laughs> Are people going to eat glass? I said you don't eat glass. But when you eat and your face is fine, you will use the glass and look at your face and praise the Lord. May the Lord make you an integrity rescuer. Stop getting yourself worked up when it comes to finances. Huh? Oh, I know people who can stay in church and argue about tight. They argue tight. 10% should we pay or not? And then the misers will not tell you, should we pay the tight on the net or the gross? Your tax, do you pay it on the gross or the net? But Jesus said, give unto Caesar... What is Caesar's and to God, what is God's? Now you pay your tax on the gross. So your tithe should be on the word. 
When they asked Jesus, they said, should we pay tax to Caesar? I like what he did. He said, bring me the coin. When they brought the coin, he looked at the coin. He said, whose superscription or image is on this coin? They said, Caesar. He said, give therefore to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. You know what he's saying? On this coin, there is Caesar's image. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. You yourself, you are made in the image of God. I see God's image on you. Therefore, give to God what is God's. You are God's image. The coin has Caesar's image. Everybody must have his own. And if the one whose image is on a coin deserves a tax, then the one whose image, the earner of the coin, is made in, he also deserves his offering and his tithe. By the way, you see, tithing or 10% is for converts. Tithing is for converts. Anytime you get up at the end of the month and calculate 10% of what you have and give it to God, you are a convert. Either you are a convert or your heart is hard. But no proper Christian would calculate exactly 10%. And give it to God. What I mean by exactly is uh, let's say your salary is 660 a month. What is the tithe? 66. What handwriting are you going to use to write the 66? And two to 70 and I day. Don't you see 70 is more handsome than 66? Incidentally, the 66, if you are not careful and you add another six, you get 666. The mark of the beast. As for those who write 55 cities, 20 pursuers. <laughs> hey, you are working this kind of account with God. If you have to tight, can you tight? Now, boy, you pay tight on the air you breathe. Pay tight on your health. Pay tight on your peace. We cannot pay God. And I like the people who say, and the tight is the Old Testament. And the tight is the Old Testament. I've written a whole book on it too. And I agree, it is the Old Testament. But it's also in the New Testament. I will not go into that. But you see, there are examples of people who gave tithe in the Old Testament. One of them is Abraham. I looked at Abraham and I said, if this man pays tithe, I, 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 don't, I don't want to keep myself at that level. Abraham gave a tenth of everything he had to Melchizedek. He didn't give it to God. He didn't give it to Jesus proper. He gave it to Melchizedek, a type of Christ. I am dealing with the real Christ. Should I also be thinking 10%? Melchizedek was a priest like unto Jesus. He appeared unto Abraham and disappeared. And Abraham gave him a tithe. In my case, Jesus is not a priest who has come and disappears. He is the high priest who abides forever. He deserves more. This man, Melchizedek, he met Abraham with bread and Abraham gave him a tithe. Jesus didn't meet me with bread. He himself is the bread of life from heaven. Melchizedek met Abraham with wine and Abraham gave him 10%. Jesus didn't meet me with wine. He gave me the power of the Holy Ghost. Fill me with the spirit of God. He deserves more. Melchizedek blessed Abraham. Jesus has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. We are in a better covenant. God is looking for people that carry an ability. I pray that you will be one. Anything he needs, may he find it in your house. Anything he needs, may he find it with you. You know what? This will not apply to everybody. But if the majority of the people 
get a revelation of giving. And a few of the people entered that realm. And I'm telling you people, in almost all our churches, there are people like that. Man of God, it will amaze you. There are people sitting in this church who can write a check of 100,000 Ghana cities and it won't do them anything. But during fundraising, they can give 1,000 and be comfortable. Because we are not listening to God. We don't listen to him. I pray that God will touch your life. In the mighty name of Jesus. I see people in your lifetime receive this grace. You will build a church building all by yourself. May you get to the place where every year, instead of CEM, renting your tongue buses to go and do crusade. I see some of you come and pack 10 buses in front of the church. And you say, Reverend Steve, here are the keys. Every year when we are going to the crusade, this is my contribution to the ministry. May the Lord make that possible. May God give you the capacity to be a rescue, an integrity rescuer. Where you are saying, Pastor, I don't want our church to depend on tithes and offerings. We are here. Every need, we will meet it. When you come to our church, we still tithe. We still do offerings. People still do, he makes a way where there is no way. Jehovah. But I keep saying in my heart, Lord, when will this end? When will one person get into church and when the person gives, the needs of God's kingdom are met. You see, I live in a place called Bogatanga. There's no way you can depend on tithes and offering and do God's work in Bogatanga. No, tithes and offering. Ubenya heart attack. My town is the town when people give the offering and take change. Don't be deceived by my suspenders. One day I heard a story in Bogatanga. This older man is chopping the church people's money. Oh, I laughed. I said, if there's money in Bogatanga to chop, you will see it. You know, they were taking offerings and then People put their offering in the basket and they take something out. So, I asked one of the pastors, I said, why are they taking the offering away? He said, oh daddy, they are not taking the offering away. They, they are taking change. <laughs> so if the person put in 10 Ghana and he intended to give 5, he puts in the 10 and takes 5. <laughs> Say that. In the offering. So if you live in a town like that and decide to depend on tithes and offerings for the ministry, you will get a heart attack. You understand what I'm saying? So, as you grow spiritually, you are supposed to grow in your giving. Some of you have been giving this 10% for 20 years. Do you think you are being dishonest? When you were earning 500 Ghana cities a month, you were giving 10%. If you give 10% out of 500 Ghana, how much is left? 450. Now you are earning 5,000 a month. You are still giving the 10%. When you give 10% out of 5,000 Ghana cities, how much is left? 4,500. So we are looking at how much we gave to God, but we are forgetting how much is left with us. At first, you were left to 450. Now, you are left to 4,500. The comparison is huge. That is why if you were earning 500, God gives you a miracle, all of a sudden, you are earning about 5,000. Then you push up your tight and take it to like 1,000. Or 1,005. Because God has blessed you. So me, that 10%, I don't calculate it. 
I know it roughly in my head. That okay, if I'm earning 700 Ghana cities, then the tithe is what? 70. I know it roughly, that is 70. But I will go 100, 150. Somebody may say, oh, it's because you are in your state. No, I have always been like this from the beginning of my Christianity. I've always been like that. I've never been a 10% person because I think it is only people with hard heart. Because why would I calculate that thing with God? I don't worship a son. He has called to be a pastor. How do I pay him tight? Ideally, by now, I should have been in a shrine. Pouring libation. God had mercy on me. And I'm sitting down with calculator. Penny pinching with God. May the Lord help us. I see you. Come to the place. You are beyond tight. You are integrity rescuer. And you know where you start? When they call people to do something, tell yourself, I am part of it. I'm telling you, if everybody in this church decides to even give $100 to a land and you have to make a sacrifice, if everybody does that, you will build the things of God with ease. I remember the first time we had to do a fundraiser in our church in Bogatanga. My wife and I had just married and we had no money. So we took our wedding clothes to go and sell. We took some of the wedding gifts and the clothing shoes, my wife's clothes, went and gave it to somebody with a store to sell for us. So every day when I'm walking in front of that shop, I have to look inside whether my goods have been sold. And I'm telling you, for a long time they were still there. Then I have to pray, oh, Katarara Shanda, Lord, move these goods. They were bought. Then we managed to pay our pledge. So it's not like some people just got up and they were there. And especially if you live in a place like where I live, you will have to believe God. I pray. May God make you that person. Amen. Some of you are saying, Amen. Others are not. I said, may God make you that person. May you be the one who will meet the needs of the kingdom. I have a friend. Let me conclude with this story. He, he lives in Lagos. I went to his church and then in fact, any time I go, he tells me a story. We saw generators. 500 kV, 250 kV, 100 kV. He said, Rev, you know, we're doing a wedding here. Cause me, Pastor Eastwood. Pastor Eastwood, you know, we're doing, um, a, we're doing a program here. And then a certain gentleman came. He saw our 250 kVA generator. And he asked me, what strength is this? I said, 250. He said, Pastor, I will donate a brand new 500 kVA to you. He said, within three days, it was here. One person. Then he looked at all the windows of his church. He said, man of God, one person did all this glass. I said, Lord, give me this kind of members. <laughs> when God makes you that kind of person, it is a blessing. But you will have to start from somewhere. Your faithfulness will be tested. With small things, little things, then God can commit much into your hand. I remember one day I was sitting in Bogatanga. A friend of mine called me from Accra. He said, um, he's a pastor. Ordinary pastor. He said, Daddy, I have a gift for you coming from Accra. Two big trucks are coming to Bogatanga. We are bringing you gifts. I said, what is that? He said, anytime we come to your church, we see you are sitting on plastic chairs. And we don't think our papa's church should be sitting on plastic chairs. 
So we have bought you padded chairs. Over 2,000. And they are on the way coming to Bogatanga. So when you come to Bogatanga, you see nice chairs. One person and his wife provided them. One person. There are people like that in the kingdom. May you be that kind of person. Amen. Lift up your hand and pray to God. Lord, touch my life. Make me that kind of person. Let me grow in my sense of responsibility. In the name of Jesus. We believe you've been blessed by the sermon. For inquiries, please call plus two three three two six seven six seven six zero five five plus two three three two six seven six seven six zero five five or send an email to info at God's word for us dot com. Info at God's word for us dot com. Yeah.